Hello, hello, hello. What a treat to be here. Thank you all for joining this session. What I want to do is talk about what everybody's talking about, which is AI. I have a view, and it's an optimistic view, it may surprise you, about why I'm excited by this and um, how I think I think about it, and maybe it might be helpful to you how you think about it. Um, where I'm going to come to is to understand these things as the universal personal intern. That's the relationship that I think I've been cultivating, and I think it might be a useful framework to think about what these things are. Spoiler, I'm going to go to the end, is that you're not going to lose your job to AI. I'll come back to that and why I think that's, but you can relax. You're not going to lose your job to AI. Hello. So what is this thing, this stuff that we're talking about? It's, we don't know. That's the honest answer. We don't know what it is. We have names for it. Um, mostly what we think of AI is all the things that it can't do yet. All right? So. When we think of AI, it's all the things that it hasn't done yet. That's what it's about. The stuff that it can do um, goes under different names. Names like machine learning and large language models, neural nets and stuff. But that's actually the names of the devices. It's sort of like talking about um, projectors and screens and cameras, which is what it produces are Hollywood entertainment movies. That's the product. The machines are different. And so we're kind of just, these are the names of the machines. We don't really have a good a name for what it is that it produces. And um, something is definitely happening. I mean, we're all talking about it. It's in the headlines. It's in the news. And it's something. It's also been the most quickest adopted technology ever like from zero to 100 million people using it almost within days, months, weeks. It's, it's incredibly fast. And so that's something. I'm um, we thinking of asking how many people here or have used it at least once, and I think I know what the answer is, um, so I'm not going to. <laughs> because it's very obvious that there's uh, a lot going on. And, the question is, well, what, what, what is it? What's special now? Why so, so fast? Why so soon? And I think the answer is, is that um, there's a little story of um, a famous song in America, John Henry, who was um, working on the railways where they had to nail in the spikes into the railways. And there was machines coming along. Until that time, it was something that humans did. And the thinking at the time among the people who were doing it was that this was something a machine could not do. It was, there was too much dexterity, too much um, agility needed to actually do these, and the machines were no good about it. And the story, of course, is that John Henry died trying to outdo the machine, and the machine kind of won. And that's what we understand now is, is that, oh, you know, that, that that's the most mechanical job in the world, hammering in spikes. It was not something that was an elevated human-only job in the, in, the, in the slightest. And I think that's what's happening right now is that it isn't that AIs are necessarily shocking us with their abilities. It's that we're coming to realize that a lot of the things that we were doing actually are very mechanical, much more mechanical than we thought. So. You know, there was um, a list of things like playing chess, which we thought went at one time was only something that humans could do. And now it turns out, oh, it's a much more mechanical process than we thought. Searching a billion pages of information was what librarians could do and a machine could. But no, it turns out to be a very mechanical thing that we could automate. Recognizing a face was seen at one time as something that was particularly difficult for humans. And we're saying, no, no, actually, it's a fairly mechanical thing that you can do and teach a machine. And so we go down this list of all these things. And right now, one of the things is like, well, painting a picture must be a very highly um, human-like activity. And we're realizing, no, no, actually, it's pretty mechanical. You can actually synthesize it. And 
having a conversation is the latest in that, and we'll keep on going to pass the test or to do your job. And so there is something going on, and I like to use the word artificial smartness to talk about it, to get away from this AI question. And it's clear that many things in our lives are already smarter than we are, like our, your calculator is way smarter than you are in arithmetic. Your navigation device, the GPS, your phone is way more a student smarter than you are in, in, in navigation. And now the new chatbots are way better and smarter than you are in synthesizing things, as we'll mention. And so we have these, we have these, these elements of smartness. And um, the issue is for us is that we have an incredibly poor understanding of our own intelligence. We, we, we really don't know how we think. And I don't mean individually, I mean we don't know collectively how we think either. And so um, we tend to think of, uh, of intelligence as, as IQ as like a decibels, where there's, it's just along one dimension, it goes higher and higher, you kind of start with mouse and your monkey, and then there's an idiot, and then there's us, and then there's geniuses and AIs. And so that's completely wrong. What we know so far is that our own intelligences and, and smartness and awareness and cognition are, is a very complicated mixture of many different kinds and modes of thinking and of the various strengths. And they, of course, differ from person to person. But we have examples from animals where, in some cases, some of their abilities can actually exceed what we can do in certain dimensions, and but in many others, they don't, but there's, again, a mix of different types of cognition in their brains. And what we're gonna do now with the AIs is that we're going to engineer them with a different complex of different kinds and, and modes of thinking, and some of their dimensions will be higher than ours, and many of them will be lower because there's always a trade-off. And that's the engineering maxim, the golden rule, the second rule of engineering, which is you cannot optimize everything. I think we're going to have, uh, start using the, the term dumb smarten for our AIs because we're going to be incredibly frustrated. It's like, how can you be so smart here and so dumb over here? How can you be so dumb when you're so smart? And there is this idea because there are different dimensions to them. They're not, they're not um, all maximized in one dimension. The main thing is that we're going to make many hundreds, if not thousands, of species of AIs. And we're going to engineer them to do different things. And they're all going to be different and different from us. And the, the, the main thing is, is, is the plural, is the AIs, is that there is not just the AI, AI, there is AIs. If we can train ourselves to say that, to understand that there are going to be many different kinds with many different qualities, many different tendencies, and um, that we're going to have to collectively have an ecosystem of all these different kind of interacting cognition types. So a good way to think about it is that we're going to populate the space of all possible minds with many different kinds of artificial minds. And, and in this space would be kind of animal minds would be some kinds, and then there's our own existing human intelligence, and we're going to be probably off to the edge somewhere. We're not in the center. There is there is no kind of, we're the central and the, and the sun revolves around us. No, 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 no. We're, we're just, we're a very peculiar kind of thinking and cognition that was evolved on this planet to survive a certain set of conditions, and it's going to be considered pretty peculiar given all the other possible minds that we can make. It's sort of like um, we're at the edge of the galaxies. We're not in the center of, of anything, really. And so I think a good way to think about these things is we're going to be making artificial aliens at these other kinds of minds, some of them quite sophisticated and interesting and maybe even sentient. We, the best way to think about them is aliens that we may never, never meet, but we're going to make ourselves with different kinds of thinking. And so... Um, the important thing about these artificial aliens and these AIs is that they are not like human. They don't think like us. They think different. And in a world where we're connected together 24 hours a day, it's susceptible to group think, 
thinking different is the engine of innovation, it's the engine of wealth, it's the, it's the engine of everything, and it becomes harder to think differently when we're all connected together, and the AIs are gonna help us to think different. We're gonna have different mixes of them, and everybody will have their own sort of soup, their own, their own kind of combination in helping them to think different because that is what we're trying to do. And so the fact that they don't think like us is not a bug, it's the feature. Think different, of course, being the, the engine of, of what we're looking for in this kind of an economy. So um, it's the, the point where they are different than humans, that is, again, a, 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 an asset rather than a liability. And we may even come to want or desire kinds of AIs, intelligences, that are not conscious, because consciousness is, in some ways, a liability. We may actually advertise things as being conscious-free, because you don't want your car to be, you want your car to focus on driving and not to be worrying about whether it should have really majored in finance instead of English, right? So, 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 so consciousness, for most AIs, is going to be a liability, and something we'd only want in certain cases. So far, all the work that we've done, all the exciting news, is really based on the fact that we've only been able to synthesize one kind of AI, or excuse me, one kind of cognition. And that type of cognition is basically um, pattern recognition and pattern generation. It's only one mode of our kind of thinking. We have not yet been able to synthesize deductive reasoning, intuitive uh, symbolic reasoning or uh, logic induction, all these other kinds of, of modes of thinking we have been unable to synthesize yet. So all the things that we've seen and all the things we uh, are experiencing right now are basically because there's been one type of cognition and that pattern recognition and pattern generation. And so that pattern generation is the neural nets, that's the deep learning that you're hearing about, and it has taken us further than we thought it could go, but is very unlikely to take us all the way of, to where we want to go in making other kinds of minds. So, um, but so far, just with that kind of cognition, we can generate things like these AI-generated images, which are basically taking two or three or four different kind of patterns and combining them together. Cat-ish, catness, you know, laceness, armorness, and combining them into these images. Here are some images that I've been generating. I've been generating images for almost a year, every day, making things. And um, this is an example of the kind of artificial creativity that these things are capable of. I say they're artificially creative in the lower case creativity, um, meaning that they're kind of everyday creativity. They're not breakthroughs. They're not the capital C creativity that we really cherish in a lot of our innovation. Um, but that kind of artificial creativity is now a commodity. It's something we all have access to, something we did not believe could be automated but we have every clear indication that we can generate lowercase creativity, the kind of creativity that, say, a logo designer, a professional logo designer would want to be making a logo every day. It's not Picasso. It's not tremendous breakthrough. It's everyday creativity that we would need to make something a little different. And that's the kind of capability that these AIs have right now. And what we're seeing is almost instantaneously they're being incorporated into everything. So the same kind of pattern generation, pattern recognition is now a plug-in for Google Sheets into your spreadsheet. So your spreadsheet now can do these pattern things and it's being built right into Photoshop. So within Photoshop you can do this. And um, Salesforce, Slack are all as quick as possible just, just bringing this in as another capability into their tools so you can have pattern recognition and pattern generation. So it reminds me of the late 1980s and early 1990s when there was a huge excitement in the internet was first forming 
And like literally every day, there would be something new and different that was useful. Unlike, say, crypto, there were things you could actually use and, and change your daily habit with. And I think this is a very similar kind of excitement right now that we're going to be seeing in the next decade where literally every day something new will be coming out and we're going to be incorporating that into our lives. So what's interesting is that I've been speaking to the people who invented it and by and large, none of the people who invented these things really knew that they were going to be capable of this. They were kind of as surprised as we were and what's happening is that the people using it, like us, are actually discovering what it's good for, right? And it's, it's, this is the, one of the messages, which is that through use, we discover the benefits and the harms of these things, not by thinking about them. It's, it's almost impossible to kind of preconceive of everything. So we're, the excitement is of, is of millions of people discovering what even the inventors of these things didn't know they could do, both good and bad. And, um, and that's sort of the question of what are they good for? So I've been interviewing and trying and polling and asking people who are using these on a daily basis, what are they using these things for? And one of the things we know about AIs is that it does jobs that humans don't want to do. So these pattern recognitions can be put into tractors so they can go down a field and using GPS as well, they can actually identify individual lettuce plants one by one and recognize, oh, I see you again, I saw you yesterday. I'm gonna analyze whether you're healthy, whether you need water or fertilizer, plant by plant. That's called precision agriculture. That's something that a farmer would like to do, but it's just simply being capable of it. And so that can transform agriculture through that pattern recognition. And it's a job that we don't wanna do and can't do. So this idea of kind of productivity of increasing the efficiency of things is something we've been using machines for a long time, and it's what we're gonna use AI for as well, the AIs, but productivity is really for robots. It's a terrible metric for humans. All the, um, you know, us, we want jobs where productivity is not that important. And what kind of jobs would those be? Well, things like science, Science is inherently inefficient. You have to fail a lot. You have to, have you have to have experiments that don't work in order to really learn anything. If every experiment that you ran as a scientist worked, you're just not trying hard enough. You're not really learning new things that way. So science is inherently inefficient. Innovations, as any entrepreneur would tell you, is, in is inefficient because you're trying things that don't work. You have prototypes, you have dead ends, you have failures on your way. Exploration, by definition, has detours and dead ends and is not efficient in art. You know, who's ranking Picasso and how many paintings per hour he's making? It's not about efficiency. So the things that we value as humans and like are inherently inefficient, including small talk and things like that. And so we're good at that and the robots are really good at productivity and efficiency. And so we're about inefficiency, believe it or not. And that's where we're gonna kind of gravitate as these AIs do a lot of the things that really where productivity counts. I think there's gonna be four models, four frameworks we can kind of imagine about AIs. And one of them is to treat them as slaves, another is to treat them as pets or animals, to have that kind of relationship, and another one would be to consider them spirits or gods, and the last one is aliens, as I said, artificial aliens. So the slave one, I think that's really dangerous. I think that's, that, that if we took the stance of treating them as slaves, as master slaves, that's incredibly corrosive to our own humanity. And that's not, I mean, that's a possibility, but that would be something that we should steer away from. The second one is as pets or animals, and these are not people torturing these, these are actually testing them to see how stable they are, but we cringe at that because it feels like they're pets. And they will, as I'll mention uh, in a few minutes, they will begin to take on some of the attributes of pets. And, and for some people, that will be a good stance in relationship. Spirits and gods are sort of what the singularitans talk about, Terminator, where they become so powerful, they, they take over, kill us, eat us, whatever it is. It's, um, 
I, I think that option also is not really very likely or helpful. The one I think that we're gonna go with is with these smart artificial aliens. They're gonna perhaps maybe have some consciousness or sentience, but they're gonna be different. And they'll be useful to us to work together with. Okay, and that is the important part is that they become assistants, co-pilots, centaurs where there's a team, team members, coaches, guides, all those kind of relationships. I think that's where we're ending up with this and these AIs. So um, that role is what we're seeing already happening with the generative art AIs, the generative chat AIs, is that they are working as a joint, uh, adjacent to us. They're not gonna take over us. We're not gonna enslave them. We are partners and team members and assistants and interns and um, we have a different kind of relationship. So I call these universal personal interns, UPIs. And we will begin often with a blank page. And one of the, the things that we're finding out about these UPIs is that they're really good at helping getting over that blank page, the first draft, the first thing. If there's an intern and they're gonna make a first draft. They're gonna have some bullet points. It will be very, it's very embarrassing to release their work as your work. Everybody can detect <laughs> that's your intern's work. And so we work with them, we, we help them, their, uh, their assistance and their helps to us. This image, by the way, I worked with my image generator intern to generate it, okay? So what are, what are people using these for right now? Uh, the, and this is the marvelous, exciting moment where, again, people were discovering all the capabilities that, they were, that the inventors did not know about. And so I've been interviewing, asking people, who are using these on a daily basis, what are you using for? So there's a guy who works with building codes. He says, I'm using it to decipher building codes because I have to just summarize these things. They're really hard to read, very laborious things, and they're just giving me these great guides into the building codes. Spot a weakness in the, this is a script writer who gives it scripts to kind of evaluate and give a third eye on, write up study courses, teachers using that. Um, to plan complex travel itineraries with lots of uh, special cases, um, producing product descriptions, you can read them. It goes on and on. And every hour, there's someone else who's discovering some way to use these as an intern. Again, they're not, they're not producing the final work. They're very involved in helping you produce your best. We've done, already done some experiments where they've shown using, say, chat uh, as a uh, footnote show, that programmers are 50... 6% more productive when they're using these interns, these UPIs, to help them write code. And writers complete tasks 37% faster when they have access to these tools. So another way that we're using them is, is to fill in blanks. So image generators, a lot, there's almost no image generating that's using to substitute or crowd out a human artist, most of the stuff being produced is being used where there is no art at all. I have an assistant who, for years, wakes up in the middle of the night, writes her dreams down, and she shares them online, but now she puts it into an AI image generator, she, she illustrates her, gene, her dreams, which is a job no artist could have done in the past. And so there's, a place where there was no art and now there is art. And that's often where a lot of this art is going is in places where there isn't any art at all. So it's filling in the blanks. And that's often true of a lot of the text and other um, parts of the chat GPI, which is generating stuff where there wasn't anything at all. So it's not really displacing humans because this is filling in the blank spaces. I did a interviews and I, I, I did an account from them to find out how many AI images are being generated and there's 30 million distinct brand new images generated every day and most of those images will never be seen again because that's one of the things about this is that 
you, you, it's very hard to get back to an image. You can't, so, so these images are, are appearing and then will forever be gone. Just the possibility space is so long. And 99% of them have an audience of one. They're being generated by and large for the pleasure of the person making them. It's almost like the same kind of pleasure you might have of walking into a, a glade in a meadow and there's backlighting and you've hiked up the mountain and you're there and you see this beautiful thing and that's why you came. You came to see it and maybe no one else will see it and that's fine, you, you are enjoying it. And that's a little bit of what these AI generates. People are generating, like myself, just because they're, it's like having my own art museum it, and I get to see them and it's just the pleasure of seeing them. One of the other things we know about AI and how it works is that it's like the wisdom of the crowd kind of knowledge. You know about the jelly bean counter. So the idea is there's county fairs and they say count how many jelly beans in the big jar and you win a prize. And what they discovered was that the most accurate um, count was the average of all the guesses. And they would call it the wisdom of the crowd. And that's what we get with the AIs. We're getting wisdom of the crowd kind of knowledge. It's sort of like, it's like, it's the average. That's how it is. It's trained on the average of all human output, the best and the worst. And it's giving us a very kind of bland, mediocre, good enough, average response. Okay, and so that can be very, very useful. Again, it wins the prize at the county fairs, that average guess, and it can be very, very useful to us, but it's not necessarily what we want to do or our best. And so what we're finding for the people who are using it is, is that um, in order to get the intern to do better is that they have to push them often. They have to push them to be a little bit more creative or actually what they're discovering is that you want to role play. You want to say, pretend that you are a, um, a mortgage broker and you've got um, in, you know, in, in uh, some other country and you have to make some decisions in a hurry. And then, so there's, there, there's kind of role playing that gets them to get out of the ordinary that is their default. And um, there is this idea that there's kind of a slider between average and creative. And the, and the problem is that slider is kind of also corresponding to another slider, which is the truth and the hallucinations that they make. They're very good at making hallucinations when they're creative, because they can be creative. But oftentimes we don't want them to be creative, we want them to stick to the facts. And so we're learning how we can steer them to say, no, 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 don't be so creative in this. I actually want to know the facts. I don't want you to make stuff up. But in this other cases, yeah, be creative. Try something that's really kind of strange and different, and I'll need to push you in that direction. So what these this kind of these pattern-generated AIs that we're talking about are really good at is synthesizing between two very different places. So you take what's between a watermelon and a jumping spider. There is this thing here that it can generate. That is very, very difficult for us to do on a regular basis. We can do that, but we don't often do it because there's so much trouble the AIs don't mind doing them in seconds again and again and again, so we can kind of waste them in that sense, right? So, so it's like, yeah, an artist, you could hire an artist to do that, but it would be a lot of work to kind of take watermelonness and take jumping spiderness and, and kind of understand both of those and combine that. And so that would be a big project, but the AIs are gonna do it in a few seconds and that's really marvelous. So we see the same thing in the text where there are different very remote, different kinds of things that you can tack, ask GPT, chat GPT to actually take, pretend you're an architect and you are going to have to design only botanical structures. What would that look like? And then they're able to, to, to mass this or take, oh, study all the chemical patents in the last year and the fashion designs and make something that's based on those, make some fashion based on the new, new chemical patents. It can do that. That's something we could do, but we would not like to do, do more than one of them, and the intern is able to do lots of them over time. So this idea of the in-between spaces, they're very, very, very good at. An example would be, give me five examples of what would happen if Rome had invented gunpowder. To do that, you would have to, 
as a human, really know the history of Rome and really know the chemical aspects of gunpowder, but the, these AIs, that is something that they're very, very good at. And as I said, it's wasted. It's, it's, it's like we wouldn't do that because it would be so much trouble, but we're kind of wasting that ability, which reminded me a lot of the early days of search. When search first came along, before Google, there was Alta Vista, and I was trained to do search in the 80s, something called dialogue, before there was an internet, and it was, it was like about $25 a minute to search for something. $25 a minute. So you only went into search with a long list of everything you needed because you wanted to go in, make that search, and come back. You would never waste a search like searching your own name. That would just be wasted. You, you would not do something frivolous about searching for recipes. It was very, very expensive. And so what search brought to us was this idea that we could just waste, or you could just search all day long, whatever you wanted to. This was this new power, and from that, we built many new products. And that we're going to say the same thing now, of making the synthesis between things, and we're just going to waste them. They were kind of very, very hard to do before. Now they're even, and we're just going to do them here and there, and we're going to kind of have that abundance of, of, of synthesis. So there are people who are better at this. There are AI whisperers who can really do this because they spent 1,000 hours whispering to these AIs in order to find out, to understand how they work, to change the word orders, to get the right spell, to trade them with other people, to actually get the best of it. And some people are really, really good. They're maybe 10 times better than others. I spent hours and hours making this image with my mid-journey AI, and it was not just clicking the button. It was a conversation back and forth, trying different things, going there like a photographer, stalking an area, oh, I think this is kind of promising, let me see what's right here, oh, that's not so good, I'll tr try this place over here, and you are together exploring and creating this thing, and I have, feel very confident about putting my name next to it as a co-creation. And as I said, the people who do this really well are now called prompt engineers or prompters, and they are sometimes 100 times better than the average person because they're spending so much time, and recently there's been three job pros postings for prompt engineering already on LinkedIn, and one of them was offering salary between one seventy-five dollars and $300,000 a year for being a prompt engineer, someone who could whisper to the AIs. So um, I think you're going to be paid by how well you work with these. Yesterday, Esther Perel did a fantastic job. She's the legendary therapist, and she was talking about someone who made a bot of her, um, and she was kind of discussing her mixed feelings about it and, and the fact that she's a therapist and this was a, someone who had taken all her podcasts and put it into these machines and had made a, a replica, an imitation of her as a bot that you could interface with for therapy. And the person who made it said it was really helpful to them and Esther said it actually wasn't bad, but it was kind of average and mediocre because it was the wisdom of the crowd of her own information. And um, the thing about that is, is that um, Esther writes books. Okay, well, her, her, her criticism of her bot was that it did not have the human nuance that, and the situational aware, awareness that you really want to have when you're trying to counsel humans. And so it was deficient in that very, very substantial way. And she worried about people becoming dependent on this artificial intimacy rather than the kind of full-blooded, very high dimensional relationship that you want to have with another human. And that's all true. But Esther writes books that are not of advice that people read that are not at all aware of the situational context of the person that is reading them. And so in some ways, her bot has to be better than a book because at least it's interacting. And there are people who swear by the therapeutic effect of having pets, like a dog. And it's very clear that the dog's own therapeutic responses may not be the optimal thing for a, for a human, right? They may, they could be wrong, they're not infallible, just like um, the bot is not fall, is going to be fallible. So in some ways, but they, the, is, is her bot, her bot may be better than a dog. And then there's also the parts of the world where there are um, people who don't have access to a dog or a human therapist where 
this bot may actually be better than no therapist at all. So, 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 so I would say that, that es the Esther's bot is actually better than a book, and it's better than a pet, and it's better than no therapist at all. And that's what we're finding out with a lot of these bot things, is, is you always have to ask, compared to what? Compared to a human, yeah, maybe not so good, but compared to nothing or none, it's a huge advance. So um, there's a movement, there's been a movement of reaction against some of this. Um, the a, there's um, no AI generated images. Some artists are call, were calling for that in the places where there were um, clearing houses and sharing of all the artists. They wanted to, to prohibit people who made AI art. And um, there was also a recent challenge where someone tried to copyright a book where the, all the AI art was from, um, all the art was from AI generators, and it was denied by the copyright office. It said that's not copyrightable because it wasn't made by human. So here we have some, a picture that is claiming to be uncopyrightable. This is obviously can't be sustained. Um, so I think, I think that the, the copyright is the wrong model for trying to deal with some of these issues. I'm suggesting that there is another kind of right or something we might think about as reference right, whether something has been referenced in the making and training of these things, not just whether it's been copied, because copies just are not the right model for this. What we want to have is some way to measure the influence of, of a piece of art in training the AI as it makes some art, but this is very, very, very hard. We don't even have measurements of influence. Everybody here has been influenced by many people in their lives, and it would be really hard to kind of unravel in our own senses of where that influence began, who had more influence, how has it come out in this particular thing I'm creating. So it's a very, very fraught enterprise to try and measure that. Um, I think we actually may come up to have sort of more ethical training AIs that have been, had a curated training set where there's much more of a selected and opt-in idea for the artist to be included in the training set. Um, but in fact, I think there also may be other sets where people, artists are, are clamoring to be included in the training set because that shows that they're influential. And so maybe there is some way to, to, to send back some of the expenses and, um, and gains and, and money, but um, the influences are generally very, very minimal. So um, all that being said about still images, I think the real superpower is not in those making photographs or still images. I think we're at peak 2D. The real revolution, the real place where we're going, the real superpower to be unleashed is when we go into 3D. Okay, we're to make 3D models or movies. So you or I, anybody here, could probably make up a little typewriter-sized page of a, a drawing of something if we had a day. But none of us could make like a 3D world. Or, uh, so it's like maybe I could draw our kitchen, but could we make a 3D kitchen that we could walk into by ourselves in a day? No, we couldn't. And an individual here could write a book, and that book could be very influential, a bestseller could reach millions of people, and it would be themselves writing the book. There's no human here who can make a movie by themselves. But these tools and the future versions of them could allow us, these interns, to assist us to make a movie ourselves, one person. And we already have examples of these AIs being used to generate video. Okay, so, so already these tools are starting to happen. And so, and then to metaverses, to, to, to immersive game worlds, which are way, way beyond a single person, but are actually feasible to, sh to happen within the powers of a one person, solo person working, having an idea, and making an entire gamer world that you could go into and play. And that would be a huge transformation in our culture. So these, this idea of solo generated movies and games, in the way that we have a solo generated song, an album, a solo generated novel, we could suddenly have that and that was gonna be very, very, very powerful. The other way that AI in, in video is very, very important is that AI allows us to search inside a video. Okay, so, so the, what I mean is, is that right now, if you do a search 
on YouTube or something, you're searching for maybe the titles, maybe the captions, but you're not look, it's not looking at actually what's in the video. But let's say I gave the AI an assignment to show me anywhere on YouTube where there's a person who opens the door and there's light behind the door. That means kind of semantically understanding or parsing all the video in the world. And that is going to be very, very powerful because it gives us access to this new cultural center. I think the culture of our center has moved from books to moving images. We used to be people of the book, now we're people of the screen. And so being able to have access and search and manipulate and understand and parse the insides of the videos even on YouTube, is going to be tremendously powerful. And that's why it actually wouldn't count out Google right now in a race for these search uh, chat GPTs because they have access to the inside of all the YouTube. And that's a very, very big um, asset. So um, technologies succeed when they become invisible. And I think that 99% of the AIs that we're going to be having in our world, we will never see at all. It's going to be behind the back office doing things we don't see. And that means that they have succeeded. So what I've been mostly talking about is the front facing, but most of the AI in the, our lives in the future we'll never even see. It's going to be behind walls and back offices doing this thing. And it's only a few that we'll actually have any interfacing with. But that interface is very important. So most of the AI that has happened so far, all the things that we're all abuzz right now today is because, not that they're doing new things. A lot of the stuff that, that the AIs are doing now, they've been able to do for years. What's new is that we suddenly have a conversational interface with them. They have ears and mouths. They are they're responding to us at our wavelength. That's what's new, is this language, what they call the large language model, is that they took the large language models and added to the existing pattern AIs, and suddenly we have a new thing. It reminds me again of the days of the internet, where we were, I was online, living online for 10 years, but it was typing, it was the command line, it was, it was like little text going by. Everybody ignored it, nobody was impressed. It was difficult to use. There seemed to be no revolution, but then when the web came, it was visual. And that visual interface transformed everything. It was like, aha, we get it. Because there was an interface evolution, revolution. And that's what's happening right now. Is this is an interface revolution where the AI has been around, but now we have this thing of conversing with it. And we're going to basically um, keep expanding that. So we'll, have it, we'll add it to everything. Everything's going to have a better conversational interface so they can become our interns. And if you have... A, uh, there'll be a zillion startups which is take something and add this conversational interface to it. Okay, one after another, we're going to see that everywhere. So that's not the end. Where we're really going to be shocked is when we begin to add emotion to it. And again, we think of this motion as something that you have to have consciousness and intelligence to have, but motion is actually going to be very, very primitive. It's actually pretty easy to program in emotion, particularly when we have these conversational things. And I don't think we're prepared for that, to, to the emotional component to these, to these interfaces. And private, you know, primitive emotions are very useful, including things like pain. It's actually not that difficult, and it's useful to, to robots to have. So, so, so we're going to kind of, ease, I'm hoping we'll ease into that with a little bit of time, because it's going to be a real shock to us. Um, last thing about the, the biases in AIs, they are trained on the average human, as I said. The best and the worst of all humanity is what they're looking at. And they are as imperfect as the average of all humans. And so are they racist, sexist, mean? Yes, because on average, that's what they're looking at. But we're not going to accept that. We don't accept the fact that they are, on average, like us. We are going to demand that our AIs are better than us. Okay, they have to be better than we are. They can't be as sexist, racist, mean, dumb, whatever as we are. We want them to be better. And it's actually not that difficult to program into AIs and ethical guidance and stuff. It's just code. And we have some ideas of um, Asimov's three rules of robotics, just as kind of as a starter, so we, so we can do things. The problem is, it's not AI alignment, it's human alignment. It's the fact that our own human ethics 
and morals are very shallow, very inconsistent, very, very vague. And when we try to teach the AIs to be more ethical and robust, we realize that we are not very consistent in this dimension. And that to, to actually try to imagine some way to make them better than us, we don't know what that looks like. Is that just being woke? Is it something beyond woke? Is it alternative? What does that look like? And what do we mean by us? So, so that's the real challenge. And in, as we try and do that, and think about that and try to create that, that process, I believe, is, 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 is going to cause basically like a 100-year end identity crisis. We're also seeing the same thing happening with genetics and trying to um, change our genes. Who do we want to be? Who should we be? Who decides who we can say this? And so this is going to be the agenda. And the AI that's coming is not just about jobs. It's about our own identity. It's like, who are we? Who do we want to be? What would better than us even look like? So I think that the, the human purpose of AI and robots is to help us to become better humans. Let me give you the final takeaway lessons from my view on this. Um, you won't lose your job. Everyone now has an intern. Working with AIs will pay. You have to push the interns to be great. Work with them together. They're really good at synthesis and just wait till they have emotions. So what would you do with your own UPI? Um, so um, oh, one more thing. I have a new book coming out. It's not, nothing to do with AI, nothing to do with technology. It's advice that I started to write for my kids. It's wisdom I wish I'd known earlier. It'll be out in May. So thank you, and we'll take some questions. So um, I'm gonna, there's some questions I see here. Um, let me start with the last one of them which is related to the idea of emotion. Of the many AIs, is it possible to have one that empathizes with humans? I think empathy is something we could breed, but of course, I don't think it would ever compare to what we would get in empathy from a human. And that's, by the way, one of the jobs that we will have as humans. I believe that we'll probably pay people to sit with us when we're ill, humans. That may become a job, where your job is to empathize with someone who wants to, and you can because you are human, unlike the most empathetic robot. Um, some it's questions about the singularity, and um, should we try and prevent the singularity from happening? Um, the singularity, for those who may not have heard, is the idea that, oh, if we can make a robot that was smarter than us, then that robot can, or AI can make an AI that was smarter than itself, and then that one can make one smarter than itself, and they could do it in a faster pace, and that maybe it would be kind of like godlike, because it would keep on going. And then that singularity would kind of rule the world. It would be so smart. And I think that's uh, very, I think that's possible, but very, very, very unlikely for a number of reasons, and mostly because of this idea that smarter than us is really not the best context or the best way to think about our intelligences. Um, this is a good question. What are scenarios with AI that do worry me? That do, am I worried about AI at all? And I would say, uh, yes, I am worried about the, the weaponization of AI and um, cyber war. And the, and the reason that I am worried about it is that it's not very accountable. We'd actually, you know, if someone has tanks blowing up, you can kind of see the, who has the tanks, where they are. With this AI and cyber war, it's very hard to tell even what's going on. And everybody's denying it, including the US. And so it's a really hard thing to grapple with. And, and, I, and, I, and I do worry about that. So um, how can we ensure that AI is used to supplement human creativity rather than replace it? So yes, that's a good question. And, and, and I think the general stance for us is to engage with technology in order to steer it. 
like, as I was saying before, the inventors of these AIs had no clue what they're going to be used for. They just didn't know. And so it's by use that we kind of understand what it is. And it's by use that we get to steer it. So by using it, we can decide what we like to use it for more for. And that gets to steer the technology. If you try to prohibit the technology, or ban it, or turn it off, or turn it down, you don't get to steer it. The people who are using it are going to steer it. So I would say, in general, engage with the technology, try to use it in the way that you want it to be used. And that's actually the most powerful way for us to make sure it goes in the direction we want. If you try and ban it, you just don't get to steer. Um, when will we have the Kevin Kelly bot for life advice? OK, so um, it would be better than the book, right? Yes, <laughs> it would. And um, I, I forgot to mention that in the Esther Perel um, thing, that, that um, uh, she actually is, is hinting that she would use this, with the, that she could use it with her, again, as an intern. That it doesn't really replace her, but she would find it useful in her own work. And I would definitely find it useful. And that, by the way, is one of the ways that some artists are using these, is that they're deciding to have the AI train on their own art, the corpus of everything they've done, to help them make more art in their own style. That would be a perfect use for, for these interns. And so I would, I would love to, to have one that's trained on me that would help me, again, as an intern, produce new ones or to have other people interact with it. And it would definitely be better than a book. Um, what is the role of governments in regulating the environment of AI development? Um, I, 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 think, um, I think government is going to be needed in regulation over time. But we always want to make sure that it's not premature regulation, because premature regulation is a killer. And it actually stops things. We, it, it, chat GBT is a baby all of two months old. It's crazy to think even about regulating at this point. We don't even know what it is. We're just discovering. It's like trying to regulate a baby. It's like we don't even know what it's good for yet. Two months old. And so, yes, I think there's going to be a, a, a very, very important part of regulation at all levels. But not at, in, in the early days, we are going to still be discovering what it's good for what it's not, and I think we should have evidence-based regulation, meaning rather than regulating on what might possibly could happen to a friend of ours, that we actually regulate on what actually happens and how people use it day to day and what actually happens in that use. And that, for that, we need more usage. So we need more people to use this. Um, what is the downside of the intern AI? That's a good question. Um, the, the downturn in the short term is that not everybody in the world will have access to it. Most people have smartphones, and it might be, may take some time. So that's the initial one, is we want to have an equitable playing field so that everybody has access to it. The other, the other danger is I believe that um, if you're going to be using generic AIs that everybody else uses, you'll have the same issue about um, Group think, thinking like them, not being able to think differently. So you might have to get good at working with your AI so it's not as not the same as everybody else's AI in that sense. Um, the other, I think, maybe downsides to working with an intern is um, that um, you there might be other skills. If you become too dependent on, there are always other skills in being creative. And you could be too dependent on that one because it's so easy. So the intern will, should only be one of many tools that you're using to be creative. If it's the only tool you have, I think that could be a downside. So um, how do you think copyright and ownership should play out with AI? As I was trying to hint at, and I didn't have enough time to say, is that I, I, I think copyright is not the best framework for dealing with what the AIs are generating. We need some other concepts. Copyright is great for the industrial age where you made copies of things, but copies, we make copies internally inside the machine. We send copies across as they're copying a message across space onto the social media. It's just not the right mode 
to be trying to understand it. So I think we need some new um, frameworks, and I was suggesting one of them is kind of like this right of reference, to reference something, and whether you have reference rights might be something that would be worth it, trying to explore as, as an alternative means to regulate what AIs generate. Um, how can individuals and organizations prepare for integration of AI into the creative process? Use the stuff. Just, it's free right now, there's tons of them. Many of them are starting to have payment um, plans, which is good because that means they'll stick around. Um, but play with them, try them, um, explore them. Most of what they're really good for, we don't know what it, they are yet. We haven't yet discovered their best qualities. I, th that's the history of technology which suggests right now, after two months, we actually don't even know what they're really, really good for, and you can be involved in uncovering that. So, so engagement is, is the main thing. Um, there are lots of different ones, and there'll be even more. If one doesn't work with you, try another one, because they have different personalities. And so um, it's like one tool doesn't fit your hand. There might be one that does. So don't give up because of the first one you tried you don't like. Um, let's see. Uh, how do I see AI impacting craftsmanship? Um, we're seeing that already, where, again, this is another tool. There may be certain functions or processes that you don't want to repeat, that AI would be very happy to repeat in an intelligent way, um, like that precision agriculture, where they're doing things that you would like to do but simply couldn't do yourself. So, so I think um, the intern model actually does transfer to craftsmanship, uh, craftsmen and craftspeople as well, that there, that there would be a way to, to use the fact that they are our helper and assistant and that we can work with them to produce things. And I think the idea of having this centaur where people understand that you know, if I make something, I use some tools to make it, and one of those tools may be something that thinks and is creative, and they're on my team, and there are many artists who produce art as a teamwork. And I think we'll become a little bit more comfortable with this idea that it's co-created with these other entities. Which jobs do I see in the future that will be replaced by AIs? So I, I think, to be fair, there may be a few very, very specific jobs that would go away. I don't think there are many. Most jobs are a bundle of tasks, and some of those tasks will be replaced, but it doesn't replace the job. You, you, and so there might be some jobs that are entirely Dependent and, and the one I, the only one I can think of is um, a person whose job it is to transcribe spoken language like this happening here into text. The AIs have been very good at that, of transcription. And so there might be some people who are professional transcribers, and I don't even know how this is. Is this a person or an AI? Can, hey, can, you, can you tell us? If you're a person, could you tell us whether this is true or not? <laughs> it's an AI. <laughs> okay, so uh, so that yeah, so so there aren't that many people doing that anymore. <laughs> and. Um, but, but I actually have, have had a call out to say, and I should have made this earlier when there was more people here, if anybody has had their job, anybody has lost their job because of AI, um, or can give me a name of a real person who has, I'd like to know about it. Because I haven't found a single person yet. Okay, I, I, have, I have not found a single person who can say, I lost my job to AI. And if you do know of someone, I would really like to speak to them. Um, so right now we have kind of a third person. Well, I can imagine a friend who might lose her job, and, but that's not good enough. So um, um, what about, okay, this is a question. What about AI being um, managed by only a few big players? What about, if, can there be a monopoly on AI? And there absolutely could be monopolies on some kinds of AIs. 
Absolutely. It will affect the network effect, and I think um, that is something that we should be careful of. My time is out. Your time is out. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. <laughs>